because I, I, I didn't really want to check into treatment, and I told my employer, yeah, I'll look into it. I'll try something. And huh. I, I wasn't ready. I was not ready to stop using. And so I called up a bunch of different treatment centers, and one of them told me they, you know, would hold the bed for me until 3 o'clock that afternoon. And I, I said, yeah, no, thank you. I can do it next week. And I knew deep down inside, waiting next week was never going to happen. Yep. So I called them back around 2 o'clock, and I said, is that bed still available? Um, I could come in tonight. So what what do you think, you know, caused that, I guess, moment of clarity for you, where you really saw that, you know, you had to get in there to, to it was, was that, uh, was that some kind of a, of, an, of a higher power intervention for you? Yeah, that, I mean, all of the, you know, pain and misery that was within me. And again, I really, I wasn't ready to stop. I was more um, at the mindset of, I'll go to treatment so I can learn how to slow down and sell drugs better. That was the <laughs> mindset I was in. Absolutely. That makes sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, so how long were you in recovery before you started? Uh, in, well, let's see. You must have been seven or eight years, or maybe even nine years, before you started doing your intervention work. Is that right? Yeah, I I, I went out and I was doing more of a, a medical billing, and 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 then I um, started working at a nonprofit in recovery, and it was the best years of my life. I mean, I just love helping other people, and I think I had about five or six years at that time. Right. I did it for about three years, and it, like I said, I just I was in heaven. And um, I, when I ended up stopped working in recovery, I opened up a business, but I was miserable because I was working to make money. I wasn't working to help people. I was working to make money. Changes everything, and, doesn't it? Oh, man, I, I mean, I, my, you know, even though I was working my program, I was sponsoring people, I was doing everything, you know, I, I was taught in, in, the, in recovery, right. but I just, I wasn't happy. I was not, my spirit wasn't happy. There's that joy that comes from the being of service, isn't it? Yeah, it was, I mean, and then my, my actually it was my mother that pointed it out to me and said, you know, years ago, you know, three years ago when you were working in recovery, you know, you were always happy. And so I gave up making a lot of money and saying I'm running up my own business. And I said, you know what, God, I will just, you know, do what's in front of me and help people get into treatment. And I started working in admissions at a treatment facility. And family members were calling me saying, well, what do I do about my loved one? How do I help them? Right. And... That's when I learned that there was even a, a business or a, a career in inventions. And I went back to school and I, you know, um, I got board registered as an interventionist. And, and now, um, you know, I started doing interventions and then I had so many interventions that I couldn't keep up. So I started working and hiring and training new people. Right. And, you know, then it blew into inter, blew up into intervention nine one one, and now I'm you know running this company that I'm doing something that I love doing. So and you, it's not about working; it's about helping others. So you, you it sounds like you followed Joseph Campbell's uh, uh, advice. Joseph Campbell was the, the the hero's way, I believe. Talked about follow your bliss, and uh, it sounds like that's exactly what you're doing. Yeah, Deepak Chopra also talks about it in his lectures. You know, he, I think he said he talks, he told his kids to do the same thing. Yeah. Follow the heart. No? Yeah, well, I, I I think we all got that from Joseph Campbell. He he, he died here a few years back, but uh, he was quite a guy. He, he was on uh, the uh, on uh, Bill Moyers on national public ra uh, radio and TV. Quite a quite a guy. Uh, so. You you actually at some point ended up on television uh, with the, as an interventionist, and w what brought that about? How did that all occur for you? Yeah, what happened is I was um, I was running my company, Intervention Nine One One, and it was 
pretty successful and it kept growing. And I heard that there was a show out there on interventions that was picked up. And so my assistant at the time was able to get the creator's cell phone number. And don't ask me how that happened. Again, that's all a God shot. Kind of a God thing. Yeah. How do you get the creator's cell phone number when, you know, I, I know nothing about TV. Exactly. And um, I called him up and he said he already had the female or the male and he was looking for a female. And I was like, no, you don't understand. I'm really good at what I do. You should interview me. And after 10 calls of harassment slash, you know, <laughs> towards to him, he said, listen, Ken, what about if we get picked up for a second year, I interview you then. Uh-huh. And and I, I said, great. And a year later, I was in line with a client in Philadelphia Airport. I remember this day. It was over five years ago. And he called me up, and he was like, hey, Ken, it's Sam. And I was like, Sam who? And he goes, Sam, from the show, we, you know, we got picked up for another year. Would you like to come in for an interview? And I was like, I'd be so honored and privileged to come in for that. Definitely, that helped- definitely a God thing, right? I, I just do, I do the, I suit up and show up every day and that's all I have to do and do the very best that I can and keep my side of the street clean and these gifts are handed to me on a silver platter. Boy, I really understand that. I'm sitting where I'm sitting basically w- with a very similar story and I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing just for the same reasons that you just talked about and uh, I, I you know, I'm do, I, I would I'm doing for free what I would do for free anyhow. Mm-hmm. I'm supposed to be getting paid at some point, though. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, I have a couple of questions about television and about addiction and and how well all that. You know, one of the things that that I saw was it just seemed so well orchestrated. I I know that there was this moment whether, gee, is this person going to walk and they're not going to you know allow the intervention to happen but to, how do is there isn't there some legal problem as far as getting their consent uh, to you know to show this the the, the uh to, to be on that show and uh, how, how do how do how do you work all that out you know actually i don't really know all the producers worked on that end of it all they did is they would call us up and say hey we got a show or a a client that needs some help um are you available and if we were they would use you know one of the three of us and then um and we would show up and and the thing i really really respect and love about the production company the network everybody involved in that show is the minute that we showed up to do the pre-intervention with the family that would normally take our pre-intervention in class between three and I would say uh, three to eight hours uh-huh. of pre-intervention. And they just, you know, didn't, they didn't get involved. They just let us do our job as an interventionist. And then the day of the intervention, the same exact thing. They just, you know, they just followed. And like what I've been doing for years but they were following with cameras, so they never got involved. None of it was ever produced, and it was re- reality. And I that's the, that's part of the reason of the success of the show is because it isn't produced, you know, at a, at, at a certain level. Absolutely. They what they get, but and, and turn it into good TV. Right. It's all really, what happens out there on the field. Well, you know, I've, I've I've read some things where some people thought that that uh, that it was exploitive, but you know, from from my from my viewpoint, uh, it's pretty tough to exploit an addict or an alcoholic. It seems to me it's more often the other way around. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I just I just it just you know I I recall the days when. And, and you probably do too. Uh, when early on, you know, people uh, made fun of the rehabs, and oh, thought, yeah. yeah, they thought they were a bad deal. They had names like spin, yeah. spin dry, and you know, some really negative kinds of things. But but what I watched, uh, Ken, was that that there was money started to be made by rehabs, and what that did was 
caused uh, advertising, which brought this all into public view, which is where it needs to be.